we're starting to harvest wheat right now. And uh, Hank, I mean, given all the rain, down south at least, I'm here in test weights 55 to 60, which, which is higher than what I thought it would be. Now, I've looked at some wheat here in the River Valley. Hank, I went and looked at your wheat variety demo the other day. I don't think there's any wheat in there that's going to have 60-pound test weight. No, I agree. Uh, you know, the wheat problems really started about February, about when we wanted to start fertilizing. And it's been wet and wet ever since then, so we've had trouble getting the fertilizer on. And I think the yields in general were probably going to be off anyway, even without the floodwaters. Uh, we've got some scab. You may know what head scab is, fusarium head blight. Uh, Hank, I went and looked at your demo the other day, and uh, of course it's all dried down right now. It's kind of hard to tell what's infected and what's not, but you, you uh, shell out those kernels, and there's a lot of grain in there that's got head blight, which is scab. And so when you haul it down to the mill, they're going to dock you for that. I mean, you're going to have a low test weight anyway, and then there's going to be some uh, whether they take it or not. I, I mean, I don't know what the test weight's going to be, but some of it's going to be pretty light. So that's, that's even good more, more good news. That, that's the good wheat, right? <laughs> Chris, you got, uh, you got quite a bit of wheat go underwater? About half of it. You know, I, I got a lot of questions earlier on. Well, say the water gets up a foot into it, and the wheat's three foot tall, am I going to harvest it? Is that wheat still standing? Yeah, you know, a lot, lot of that's, yeah. Eight foot over, we don't have to worry about those fields, do we? You know, I guess some of the questions were, I mean, what are you, you going to do with that? I mean, the, the straw is probably laying on the ground, isn't it? Wouldn't burn if you wanted to burn it, probably, so probably just dropping in and planting some. What's that? The, yeah, the smell isn't too good. Rotten wheat is not, not very good, I know. Rotten soybeans later on would have been worse, I think, but... Yeah, you know, the, the questions I got on, on the wheat that had water a little bit into it, and I know we got a lot of fields that got spots in it, uh, you know, some of them's eight foot, ten foot deep, some of them may have had six inches of water, but the wheat that shut down prematurely, even though we were about, about at maturity or probably were close to maturity, that wheat that shut down early, the test weight's probably going to be impacted. And even where we had the holes where we lost our nitrogen earlier on or never got the nitrogen out, that wheat, the test weight's probably going to be light. So I, I think from the wheat standpoint, the, the, you know, the biggest problem on, on the wheat that we're going to harvest is you know, the yield's probably going to be off, and then that test weight's probably going to be off. And I know last year you guys had a lot of what? Robert, what was some of the, the test weights last year? They weren't very good, I know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the discounts for te low test weight wheat right now is pretty steep. I had one of the grain guys tell me the other day that there is absolutely no market for test weight, for wheat that has a test weight less than 58. And because they got a lot of it already in bins from last year, they were hoping to blend, blend in to, you know, get, get rid of some of it. So the, the, de the dockages on that test weight, low test weight wheat is probably going to be pretty high. Yeah, and you know, a lot, if the pr corn price is real high and the wheat price was low, we could, we could you know, feed some of that wheat. But uh, you know, right now, corn's cheaper than wheat, so there, there's probably not a lot of market there for that. So, I, but I guess the questions, you know, a lot, maybe some more questions is uh, I've had a few guys here in the last week or ten days ask about planting corn and grain sorghum, and uh, some of them they had contracts that they. Uh, you know, their first stand they didn't make, or some of them they didn't get the first planting planted at all because it's too wet. And we've done a lot of planting date studies in the last six or eight years. And, uh, you know, with, with irrigation, you know, in our trials, we planted some the first week in June and made over 100 bushel, 125, 150 bushel. But that's with irrigation, that's when everything goes right. And to, to me, I, I'd have a hard time planting corn right now. Uh, unless it's for silage, talked to a gentleman a while ago. We had some he's going to chop for silage. Maybe, maybe that. You know, you talk about planting, planting corn and harvesting it for grain. You know, if you make it, get it up, get it going, water it all throughout the season. You know, you're looking at an October 
harvest time frame probably October end of October November what what's it doing then rain it's not drying Chris, you, 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 your corn maze over there in Conway, you planted some 4th of July or after that, and I know one year you told me you harvested it, what, January? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's about the time it finally dried down, wasn't it? Yeah, so, you know, I, I don't think planting corn is really a viable option unless you've got a dryer and a bin and all that. You've got capability of drying it down. And to be honest, uh, you know, a lot of the diseases, Southern rust, you know, we have that come in a lot of years later in the season. And, you know, corn planted right now, it's going to come in. It's going to come in early. You'd probably have to spray it twice. So a lot, a lot of inputs into it, a lot of risk, and then ultimately to me, probably not a lot of output. Uh, grain sorghum. Anybody got grain sorghum? Have any grain sorghum go underwater? You guys have some didn't have any grain sorghum you know and I know there's probably less grain sorghum over here than there is a lot of other other areas of the state but uh, you know I've, this morning I've gotten two phone calls people in the, the Delta were, were gonna plant grain sorghum today or this week and uh, it's all kind of like corn I mean we're, we're at the point we're losing a lot of yield right now every day just based on where we're at calendar wise uh, we can water it you know, maybe 80 to 100 bushel might be optimistic. And then we run into the same things, Chris, about uh, trying to get it dried down. I mean, you're looking at an October t harvest date. You know, letting it dry down out in the field is going to be pretty hard to get it dried down to 14% moisture most years. I had some a few years ago. I planted the 5th or 6th of July. It made 80 bushel, and it was one of those years. It was about 80 degrees in October, late October. We got it dried down, got it out. The year before that, it rained and rained. It fell over, and I basically ended up with nothing. So I think there's a lot of risk out there, and I know a lot more grain sorghum planted this year. Some of them may have some contracts obligated to feel like they're going to have to plant it. Uh, but you know, if I had a, a way to get out of it I, at this point in the game, I'd probably try to get out of it. What about if you got been? Question was uh, bins, corn, or grain sorghum. Either way, corn would be a lot easier to dry in a bin. You can put the air through it. The air will flow through it a lot, lot quicker. Uh, you know, you're going to have to spend more money on a corn crop, but to me, I would feel better about the corn than I would grain sorghum if, if you can water it. Uh, you know, the grain sorghum, it, you know, it's a, it's a lot smaller grain. It's harder to push the air through, and ultimately, it's harder to get dry. And, and mold, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, you know, some of them are, and there's going to be some dried this year, never never tried it before, and there, there's probably going to be a learning curve for some of them, yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of this corn probably put out a lot of side dress nitrogen already, and just like some of these fields that we were talking about earlier, you got holes out there, the bottom ends of even the high field, you've, you've got yellow corn, and you know, to me, we always talk about this pre-tassel nitrogen, you know, kind of spreading our nitrogen fertilizer out over a longer period of time. I think this year is where some of that pre-tassel nitrogen would probably benefit. Uh, now, if you've got corn that's, you know, boot top tall and it's bright yellow and your good corn's head tall, you know, there's no bringing that, the stunning corn back. But I think in general, some of these ups and downs where even though it may be green right now or relatively green, I think some of that late nitrogen would probably be a benefit. But do you think that stuff that's that's yellow, it didn't go under water, it's just terrible water stress. You don't think it's going to come back? If you went out there and counted leaves, it's probably the same growth stage as your bigger corn. And uh, I, I don't think it'll have much yield potential personally, the stuff that's really stunted right now. Uh, it may kind of kind of kind of come on, but the yield potential is already gone on a lot of that. And so, you know, if you're going to put some extra fertilizer on, I wouldn't go overboard. I mean, 100 pounds of urea would be all that I would consider putting out, if that much. What else going on in corn? Grain sorghum, wheat. Chris, how far off is the wheat from trying? You can try some today. It's ready. Yeah. My neighbors were cutting this weekend. Yeah. They didn't cut much for some reason. I didn't see them. Yeah. Probably yeah. couldn't deliver it anywhere because of 
All the facilities are out of I bet the water. all the facilities, well, yeah. up our way, the facilities are out of the water, but they're having to, they're having to redo everything because they had to have everything put away. The river's down, but it's, they're still regrouping. Yeah. Hey, Jason, I was outside. Yeah. Yeah, the, the question was uh, crazy top and corn. You know, I don't know if you've heard, you know what crazy top is? It's basically a, a fungus that gets in the plant, corn plant, when it goes underwater usually. And then later on, it has this distorted growth. It has a lot of tillers and stuff. It just looks crazy. That's why they call it crazy top. I mean, it's, it's from a fungus that's normally there. Uh, if it doesn't go underwater, it's not a problem. And even when it does go underwater, sometimes we don't have a problem. But you may see some of that this year that you had some in the past, Robert. We, we haven't had much tr trouble with corn going underwater yeah. until this time. Yeah, and yeah. Typically that's the high ground that we, you know, we put the corn on, so that's yeah. where you get into quickly. Yeah. But you may see some of that. I mean, it's uh, it almost looks like you dosed it with 2,4-D. It'll, it'll get crazy instead of a tassel up there. Later on in the season, you may have a 100 different shoots coming off. So it looks like a big ball of leaves where the tassel is sometimes. You may have 10 ears on a plant or something. I mean, it does crazy things. And so it's, it's, it's the same fungus that you see downy mildew in wheat. It's crazy top and wheat. It affects wheat, grain sorghum, corn, and you know, a lot of our grass crops. So that's something you may see. And, and really, there's not anything you can do, do about it. Uh, no, none of the seed treatments or anything like that is going to take care of it. Yeah, Hank? Jason, can you address, you know, this strong management issue on this wheat that has been underwater for the last two weeks? And, you know, what we're going to do once the water gets off and we're going to have all that straw laying around? Can you address that? By well, to, to me, I think, like Tom alluded to, that wheat straw that's, if it's been underwater and had walk, moving water through it, it's probably laying flat on the ground, I would think. A lot of it's still standing. Okay, you've got. If it didn't flow, if, if, if it's just backwater, it's probably standing. You know, something like that, you could burn it. You know, if it's laying flat on the ground and you could no till soybeans into that, I think that's, that's the way I would go. Hopefully, you don't have to dry, move a lot of debris or logs or anything like that, but you may have some of that out there. But, you know, if it's the straw is flat, I think I would try to just no-till soybeans into that because that cover is going to provide you some weed, weed control. Now, corn, you know, I, one gentleman he was going to plant some corn. Now, I think sometimes that residue might tie up some of your nitrogen. I've seen that in the past. So uh, it depends on what, what case you've got. If you're going to soybeans, I think would think no-tilling would be good. If you've got straw standing there, I mean, you could burn it. That's uh, what a lot of times we typically do. If you get a lot of horseweed out there, you know, the, the, the fire, if you had a good hot fire, would take care of any of the horseweed as well. Uh, you know, if you till it, uh, I, I did some of that last year in some plots, and we, we, I think we had to work it about five times to get a seed bed to be able to plant into, and, and then what's going to happen? You're going to lose all your moisture. So I think moisture is going to be an issue, you know, right now under that wheat straw. If you harvest it or don't harvest it, it's probably got you got good moisture. You work it up a little bit wet, bring clods up, or it makes it cloddy, and then, then you got a real problem if it doesn't rain. So I, I, I would think a no-till situation might be as good as anything.